Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the MBTA Multifamily Zoning Facts and Myths meeting. Yep. Okay. Uh, tonight we, we will be having a uh, Zoom meeting, uh, but it's unmanned, so there will be no uh, Zoom questions. My name is Clayton Sobe, and I'm the chairman of the Cape Ann Political Action Committee. Uh, we'll have three speakers this evening. Uh, attorney Mike Walsh. <laughs> former City Councilor Tracy O'Neill. and attorney and Manchester Planning Board member Christine Delicia. Now, after, uh, after each speaker, there will be a question and answer session. So um, I'd like to say a little bit about the numbers as I see them before we get to our speakers. In 2020, we had 1,941,000 housing units in Massachusetts. If this MBTA mandate is allowed, it will increase minimum multifamily unit capacity in Massachusetts by 296,000 if they're all built. And that's only the minimum they're targeting. There's provisions in the mandate for much more. Proportionately, the minimum they're pushing will be a 15% increase in Massachusetts population. With a population of seven million people now, that's over a million more people jammed into this state on top of the people that are already here. Now, where are these people going to come from? Who is going to pay to educate their children? Build the new schools, the in infrastructure, the hospitals, the social services uh, this mas massive influx will require. Who's going to employ these people? The office vacancy rate in Boston is already hovering near 20-year highs, and the globalists have already offshored tens of thousands of jobs in our once thriving manufacturing center. How will people already here, especially our young entry-level people, how are they going to survive when a supply of a million new low-wage earners arrives and breaks their labor market? I see no indication that the state of Massachusetts, already a billion dollars in the hole for this fiscal year, is going to provide the funding for any of this. There are certainly lots of unanswered questions. Hopefully tonight, we can discover some answers. Thank you all for coming. And our first speaker will be Mike Walsh. Hello everyone, my name is Mike Walsh. I'm an attorney out of Linfield, practicing in a small family firm. Uh, my claim to fame at the moment is that I'm representing Mr. Kolakowski and several of his friends from Rockport who are suing the you know, state government in Essex Superior Court claiming that the MBTA housing law is unconstitutional yes. under the state constitution. <laughs> The primary thesis that Mr. Kolakowski's suit has proceeded under is the idea that this mandate violates uh, what's referred to as Article 89, which is the Home Rule Amendment of the state's constitution. It was adopted by the voters in 1966 in November by a, a vote of approximately 1.1 million to a little over 200,000, uh, overwhelmingly adopted. Home Rule generally stands for the premise that uh, local government has local control. When the 1780 constitution was, state constitution was adopted, which is the oldest still in existence constitution in the Western Hemisphere, uh, I'm getting the sign, no trivia. Um, <laughs> oh, in the slow down sign, excuse me. Uh, the theory was that cities and towns ceased to have any independent existence. They could only do that which the state legislature allowed them to do. That stopped in 1966 with the adoption of the Home Rule Amendment. We, rec we reversed a long-standing common law presumption called the Dillon Rule in favor of an idea that cities and towns have their local existence, the idea that there is local control. They can structure their government how they want to and pass local laws for their own, essentially design their community how they want to. If you want to be a busy port city like 
Gloucester, or a small bedroom community like Linfield, or a tourist town like Rockport. That's your whim, and you can control your own local future destiny. It's why you can pass bylaws and have local police and all that kind of thing. So home rule is very important to a lot of, it, it's the constitutional underpinnings of a lot of the local officials that we deal with every day in our lives. It, it, zoning has long been recognized as one of these local powers, and as a result, uh, for those who are familiar with, chapter, with Section 3A of Chapter 40A, it's a new law that says that anywhere that you anywhere within half a mile of mass transit, bus, subway, or rain, trail, or whatever have you, you have to have a high-density zoning district consisting of at least 15 units per acre. So it's essentially designed to allow large multifamilies or more probably like big apartment buildings. Um, so you have to draw at least one district. It all, the law also authorizes the state housing department to develop guidelines to implement it. One of the things that we're challenging in Mr. Kolakowski's suit is the idea that the state guidelines have kind of run away from the mandate that the, that the elected representatives voted into the law. Uh, now, instead of just having this one high density zoning district, all of a sudden you, you have to have both acreage that's available for development as of right, as well as high density, and you can sort of average them or split them up or draw different districts. It, it's a crazy map program, they've got a very complicated modeling program that's attended to by a pre-selected list of, of state consultants who, who know what's up and what the housing mandate is. Uh, so the short answer is that Mr. Kolakowski's suit, we're trying to argue that this is unconstitutional, that the state is stepping in and telling cities and towns how to deal with local zoning issues, which are inherently a local concern. Uh, because under the 1973 Zoning Board of Appeals Hanover case, it is recognized that under Section 8 of, excuse me, Section 6 of Article 89 of the Amendments to the State Constitution that zoning is an inherently a local power. There really shouldn't be any authority for the state government to come in and say Gloucester has to draw a district, Rockport has to draw a district, Linfield has to draw a district. Uh, the, this uh, mandate from the state has a very broad reach. It, it, reaches 177 cities and towns, which is essentially everything inside of 495 and a little besides. Uh, it, 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 it's a very broad, uh, and, and there are some cities and towns which have already adopted this. There are some cities and towns which say uh, that we don't need it. There are some that say that, that it, it's perfect for us, it's gonna spur housing that we desperately need, and there are others that are fighting to reject it. Uh, the, the bullet points of those are that the town of Holden, for, for example, has refused to comply. You may have seen the newspaper recently that the town of Milton uh, was presented with an article and they overturned it at the popular ballot. Uh, the, the town of the city of Woburn, for example, has said that we already comply, so we're not drawing any fancy fancy district or doing anything like that. Uh, the legislature has recently uh, passed a couple of bills to give cities and towns $25 million in technical assistance grants because this is not easy to comply with. Uh, the guidelines are a nightmare and a half. Uh, when this was initially passed, it was part of a 200-page economic development bill that Governor Baker signed in 2021. It has since gone on to take a life of its own. One of, the, one of the original selling points was that this is going to spur housing production, particularly affordable housing. It is now no longer an affordable housing bill. In the guidelines, they have expressly decoupled affordable housing from the premise of this bill. Now, if your affordable housing requirement for the new units is too high, the state will reject it, saying that it's no longer compliance. The law says has four very specific consequences. It says that if you don't draw one of these, at least one of these MBTA housing districts, that you are gonna be ineligible for four specific state grants. Uh, they're housing choice, uh, mass works, housing works, and I believe it's the local choice initiative, but don't quote me on it. Uh, and the state housing department has since then decided that in addition to those four grant programs, we, are, we believe that your non-compliance non will make you ineligible for another 13 other grants. Uh, some of the slides that have been going around in the pro META housing camp have also suggested that cities and towns that don't comply could, pr could put your Chapter 70 school money or your Chapter 90 road money at issue. Because those are completely separate story, statutory schemes, there looks to be no authority to justify that, and I personally tend to think of that as a, as a scare tactic. I've only seen it on a couple of slides, not a whole lot. Um, other than that, uh, the, the guidelines uh, are a little funky because they're 
not really laws. Uh, for those of you, I won't bore you with a semester's worth of administrative law. The short answer is, is that most laws are passed by the governor and signed by the two, or passed by two houses of the legislature and signed by the governor. If a law is really detail-oriented, we, we give administrative agencies the power to draw regulations. In this state, much like a federal, there's an Administrative Procedures Act, you have any law that has the binding of an effective law has to go through a public comment phase, a public hearing phase, and then it has to be published in the Massachusetts Register before it becomes effective law. The State Housing Department, in a memo that was uh, put, by, put out by the, Milton ch the chair of the Milton Planning Board, Attorney Whiteside, about a year ago before he passed on, says that the State Housing Department is afraid of the kind of public comments they would get. Now, they sort of mimicked this public notice and comment theory because they opened it up for input from the local cities and towns. And overwhelmingly, before the guidelines went into effect, uh, the, most of the cities and towns said that this is a one-size-all-fits formula, they said that this is going to do terrible things to downtown. They said it's going to squeeze out businesses. It's going to create more housing. That's going to alter our Chapter 40 beat 10% numbers. And there were a lot of criticisms. But from the, the Rockport Planning Board, Manchester, Gloucester, Linfield, you name it. As far as I can tell, almost every city in town said that the initial guidelines were terrible. The state reworked it in response to a lot of public criticisms, but it still didn't subject it to this formalized, rigorous process through Chapter 30A. And so as a result, these are still guidelines and not laws. One of, the, one of the complaints of Mr. Kolakowski sued is that, is first of all, that uh, the, the state housing department is not allowed when the legislature has gone to the trouble of saying that there are four specific penalties to add additional consequences for noncompliance because the legislature thought about what noncompliance meant and they already fixed one penalty to it. But the second argument in Mr. Kolakowski's suit is that because it hasn't gone through this uh, chapter 38 process and been codified as one of the regulations, it shouldn't have the force and effect of law. There are a couple of exceptions to regulations uh, that don't have to go through this public comment period, but there's stuff that doesn't affect the public rights. When you're dealing with internal management of government employees, stuff that the public doesn't see, that doesn't have to go through public notice and comment. When you're dealing with stuff that already has a different regulation scheme, like road signs, you don't have to go through stop signs and speed limits, don't have to go through, they have their own separate process that's governed by a different set of rules. But there's no, gu there's no process about what these guidelines are, how often they change or who can change them, other than the fact that there are three government departments who are entitled to have influence into the changing of the guidelines. Right now, the final guidelines that are in effect were put into place in October of 2023. They're a little complicated. Mrs. Delicio is going to go into them at some depth. Um, other than that, the law itself is an outgrowth of an idea. Uh, are any of you familiar with a, a term called complete streets? Complete Streets is a grant program that the federal government developed, or the state developed with the addition, assistance of the federal government. And it's the idea, if you think of big, broad European streets with multiple lanes and bike lanes and room for parking and speed control devices and shade trees and sidewalks, a great big, wide boulevard. And they said, this is our idea of a perfect street. And we know that in these New England towns with these small, windy streets, we're never going to get there. So they said, we will chip grant money into any city or town that's going to take steps towards that goal even if they never get there. So it funds things like sidewalks or widening streets or whatnot. As, an out, as this program has been in effect for I think almost about 15 years or so, uh, the next evolution of it was the idea of a complete neighborhood. The idea is, is that there should be a complete neighborhood that's walkable. If you think like downtown Manhattan or the Bronx, on every block you should be able to hop on the subway and go anywhere under the green sun. There should be a local bodega at, at, your, at your corner to help you get your groceries and you should be able to get anywhere in the world and do anything you need with a 15 minute walk. That actually is where the half mile uh, acreage point in the law came from, is the idea, it's extension of this complete walkable neighborhood idea. Unfortunately, it might work in the Bronx or in Manhattan, downtown Manhattan where you've got a lot of high clustered density and you have everything you need to live. But when you're, for example, Holden and you have a train station out in the middle of a small downtown in, in, in sleepy suburbia and you might have a grocery store two towns over, God forbid your city is not walkable, your downtown won't suffice what you need and even if you can hop on the train, the train only goes in one direction to Boston and back. It's not really uh, suitable for, for life like one would imagine in New York City. Uh, that I think is the highlights of the law and the rough summary of Mr. Kolakowski's suit. Um, 
Presently, the state has moved to dismiss our suit, claiming, among other things, that their guidelines are good because they've got a statute. They've claimed that they, that they don't have to do their job and that no one can make them, that we don't have standing to enforce them to comply with the state constitution, and a few other things along the way. And other than that, I think I will take a couple of questions. If I remember right, there's a Q&A session at the back of the, and as speakers too, so I'll take a couple now if anyone had any questions. Well, other than that, I will, uh, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you reiterate that? Oh, question? forgive me. The question was, uh, do I? The the question was, do I represent folks who are opposing the MBT housing claiming it's unconstitutional? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Well, the, uh, there are. Can you reiterate the question? Uh, the question is, what what can the average citizen do about the three A uh, MBTA zoning mandate? And I'd offer you three quick answers. The first of which is that Mr. Kolakowski is looking for people to join. We're trying to have citizen committees from other cities and towns join and move to intervene in our lawsuit. He has a draft format uh, for anyone who's interested, and I suspect that if, if you contact him, he'll be happy to get it to you. The second thing is that, believe it or not, the reason that the state law says that cities and towns have to draw the district is because zoning is inherently a local legislative activity. It requires the say-so of either town meeting or city council. So if you either attend town meeting or you're on your city council, you can work on it. Uh, there, is, there is a phase-in period uh, for most high, tra high speed transit had to comply by last New Year's Eve. Most other cities and towns have to comply by the end of this year. Uh, so so most... So mo most cities and towns are going to see this on their warrant articles in town meeting this year. Uh, all I hear is reverb, but okay. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is just say no. Believe it or not, I mean, like in Milton, you know, the worst that happens is the Attorney General comes and says you should comply. Uh, the Attorney General's suit is a suit to the single justice of the state Supreme Court, and I don't know that it's going to go anywhere at all, to be perfectly blunt, but she says you, unelected court, should appoint a special master to draw a zoning district, which is, uh, I don't think that's going to fly, and I've already seen a lot of criticism about that. The town manager out in Holden, in response to the, when he saw the Milton suit, said that we don't li yet live in a world where unelected judges can tell voters how they have to vote. So the short answer is, is that if you want to oppose it, stand up and say no. Uh, or tell your city councilor to do so. For those of you who live in smaller cities, anything but Boston or Springfield, the other thing that you should do is that in, in, uh, there is a standing provision. One of the things that they did in order to make it easier to adopt this is that when they passed this, these pro-housing initiatives is they said that it's too hard to get the normal two-thirds majority vote that you have to get at town meeting or at the city council. They lowered it to a simple majority and the, and, and, and to make it easier. And, and it, it's not any adoption. It's only if you opt in, it's a simple majority. Thereafter, any changes require a two-thirds majority to change it. 
uh, that's one of the things that Mr. Kolakowski is bringing in his suit is to complain about this lowering of the threshold based on Rockport's uh, initiative when they adopted it about a year ago. But there's a provision in the law that says if you're in a city and you have a small city council, uh, it actually applies here in Gloucester. If you can get enough signatures from the abutters or from people who are nearby and affected, you can send a petition into the city council and into the city clerk, and that will move the vote threshold quantum to adopt one of these zoning districts back up to two-thirds. So for those of you who want to know what you can do, I strongly recommend you go out and start collecting signatures from abutters in nearby zoning districts. Because if you get a petition together, you can force the vote up. Uh, I'm not sure. I think there was talk that one had gone into Gloucester a year ago. I do not know if that is still valid or still enforced. Basically, if they wait a certain period of time, you kind of have to re-up the petition. So I, I don't know where that stands in Gloucester, but that's one of the other things you could do. Uh, beyond that, the other thing that I've heard is that when you go and talk to state reps and, and you look at this awful program that the state housing department's put out through these guidelines, they say, well, we just voted a very simple law that says that there should be a high-density zoning district and it should have 15 units per acre. They didn't vote for you know things like the acreage requirements or allowing you to average it or putting, uh, for example, part of the reason that, that the Milton referendum failed is because they soaked one small area of town and it won't surprise you that every single neighbor came out to vote. And the turnout in those precincts was really high <laughs> and it was all no. Uh, the short answer is, is that when you're affected, vote. Uh, vote, come out, always talk to your state reps if you can. It wouldn't surprise me if you saw that the election this year may very well turn in state rep races, may very well turn on whether or not people think this is a good law or not. Generally speaking, a lot of the larger cities are in favor of it, mostly because they already comply and they have a lot of housing density. A lot of suburbia and some of the more, even dare I say, rural towns seem to be opposed to it because they already have a small enough downtown they're concerned about what it would do and what its impacts are. In, in some cities and towns like Manchester, if you draw a half hour, the, the half mile radius circle in Manchester, something like 50% of it is ocean. I mean, you could not get the, rec the right acreage if you, if you got down on your knees and begged God Almighty. Uh, so some of this is impractical, it's impossible. Yes, ma'am. That example that you just gave about Manchester, does that mean that they can find the acreage elsewhere in the community? Under this, under the... It's not specified in the state statute, but in the, in the guidelines put out by the state housing department, yes, they can. Oh, my apologies. The question was in the example of Manchester where almost half of the half mile radius circle is water and so you can't build on it. Can they put the acreage other places? The state guidelines as put out by the housing department say that yes, you can. The, state, the actual state statute itself says nothing about acreage. Uh, so the answer appears to be yes, but it's not clear if the state... But they're working with the guidelines. Working with the guidelines, the answer is that yes, you could put the acreage elsewhere. I think only 40% of the acreage actually has to be in the half mile radius, which that's a whole different kettle of fish about whether or not the administrative agency's guidelines comply with the state statute. Yes, Mr. Sepala. Yes, uh, Mr. Sepala, and I agree with Grant City Rockport. Uh, at last week's meeting, uh, Mike, you mentioned your meeting, not the town's meeting. You mentioned that uh, you would talk to some state legislatures, I think you said that, and they said they didn't even really know what was in this large economic development bill that was passed in 2021. I think you mentioned that. Whether you did or you didn't, it's not important. But it was part of a big bill. And the question I have is we had, through John's uh, group here, we had the uh, candidates for the state auditor down in Rockwood about a year ago. And the Republican candidate said, as part of his pitch, he said, you're going to try not to elect a Democrat to the state auditor position where they're auditing other Democrats. He lost. Diane Isoglio at the one won. And she is on a tear to be able to audit all of these state offices, the legislature included. And she's run into a lot of pushback. So the question you have is like you're saying that you could go to and try to ask your state legislature to change their vote. My question would be to ask them, how did you vote? And did you know what you were <coughs> voting for when you did? And I suspect I'd get no answer on the phone call. But is there uh, 
something in there that you can, you know, force this issue to have them come out and say how they voted until Diane gets her power to audit her. Uh, it's, it's the most secret legislature in the United States. It is, and it's been rated that way several times. Uh, to answer your questions in reverse order, uh, I'm not the best person to ask because I'm representing a criminal defendant uh, who presently would prefer to not have the legislature audited, so I am on the record in the Worcester and Suffolk Superior Court saying that the legislature shouldn't be audited as a matter of my professional interest. As a matter of my personal interest, I'd say who wouldn't want the legislature audited? Um, <laughs> leaving all that aside for just a second, in terms of forcing them, your legislature, even though it is, in fact, one of the mo least transparent entities in the nation, is also one of the few that you have a lot of direct control over. You, under your state constitution, have a right of free petition. You are entitled, if you file a bill in time, to, to, to have a bill and to go out on the record. They have to give you a hearing. You're entitled to speak on it. And more importantly, they're, they're, I mean, in, in terms of being responsive, yes, they might be immune for 600 days until the next term comes up. But the short answer is, is that you would be, I used to, I, I interned for both my state rep and my senator when I was a kid. And I got to tell you, we used to get a lot of posts guards from advocacy groups, and we used to get a, a couple of you know, special interest bills, oh, my kid needs a lifeguard job with the NDC or whatever it happens to be. But generally speaking, any kind of individualized personal concern always got a lot of attention, because I got to tell you, state reps set their own hours, state senators are the same, and they have staff to help them out. And other than doing whatever the lobbyists come and bring, them, bring to them to work on, they only pass about 400 bills a year, and of general laws, only about 20% of those are laws of general jurisdiction. A lot of the laws they pass are to approve you know, some deviation of the charter in Manchester or to approve a sick bank for an employee of the judiciary. Most of the work they do, they do in an absolute void. Many people don't talk to the state le legislators or don't even know who they are. So, so making contact with them in terms of putting them on the record, I don't know how, quite how easy that is, but the first step is to try, because you would be amazed at the absolute lack of contact. I mean, I used to, represent a uh, used to intern for a state rep in Saugus, and he, and he was as nervous as a cat that someday he was going to run into someone who might know something about some issue he'd voted on. I mean, literally, he wouldn't go to any contentious issues or any forums where he might answer any contentious questions. Uh, the other question that you had related to um, the bill. Uh, one of the opponents of MDTA zoning in the Milton vote said, oh, it's a 6,000-page bill. Uh, WBUR went and did a retrospective. It is a big bill, but it's not thousands of pages. I'm afraid to say it was only 192 pages long, and most of it was bonds. Uh, the, in, in the same economic development bill, they voted hundreds of millions of dollars of bonds, and much as we're you may or may not be offended by MBTA zoning, you would certainly hope that your legislator would keep a very close eye on where the money is. So to the extent that maybe they didn't know what they were voting on, I, I certainly wouldn't blame them if they were looking at the money as opposed to a zoning issue that might not go into effect for years to come or they'd have time to change. The other thing I can tell you is, is that this isn't a constitutional mandate. This is just a state statute. If, if you can get two, two houses of the legislature and the governor you can change the law. Uh, it, it isn't some ironclad straitjacket. It's all sub, it's subject to interpretation by the agencies, by the courts, by the lawyers. I mean, it, it's a long way from being a fixed final product that this is a straitjacket you must step into. The, the, one of the key things was, you said was that when it was initially conceived in 2021 or whatever, it was designed to try to provide more affordable housing also. Yes. And that's nowhere in the final result as far as, as, far as if you're not within 80% of the in, in the final result, the guidelines as presently implemented say that if, if, you afford, if the restriction for affordable housing is more than 10%, you have to do an economic feasibility study and the state won't approve it unless it's economical. But considering that 10% is also the threshold for 40B, they're saying that you can't use MBTA housing to make up your difference towards the 10%. You're going to create more housing, but at best you can keep it neutral to the 40B ratio. They're not going to allow you to gain ground on the 40B of affordable housing ratio. So no, in terms of affordable housing, it's a terrible law. You, sir, had a question. Lane Charney from Rowley. You had spoken before about discretionary grants and any of the scared assets that are being thrown at you in terms of money that they're going to use I didn't hear clearly whether certain like school funds, they kind of up the ante in terms of the private. So separating those out, 
where are they saying things that are not accurate in terms of the things that can and cannot be done? So to be precise, the Oh, uh, the question is where specifically do the grants and the potential uh, funding consequences from non-compliance come? The answer is, is that the law itself, in the law itself, there are four specific grant programs that are mentioned. The State Housing Department has put out a list of 17, four plus another 13, where they say that if you don't comply, we using discretionary grants, we're not going to give you any, any we're not going to give you any granting funding if we can avoid it. Uh, in terms of the other funding that some of the slides have been arguing, like Chapter 70 school funding, that's the foundation budget, that was part of the MCAS bill following the McDuffie Constitu State Constitutional Decision on the Right to End Education, and the Chapter 90 money, which is a given a according to a very complex funding formula based on your number of road miles and how well your roads are maintained and how, what types of roads they are and such like. There, because those are separate statutory schemes, there is no indication that not, and, and they're not discretionary. The state has to put those out according to a formula. There is no indication of any kind, even though some of the proponents of MBTA zoning have said that if you don't comply, these other pools of money are at risk. There is no indication I can see that it's going to touch school or road money. The, the one threat that has been circulating around is, is that they may choose to cut local aid, general unrestricted local aid. In addition to certain specific uh, you must pots of money that you must use for, the state also gives most cities and towns a rather large pool of money that varies year to year based on how well the state budget just doing. And because it can grow and because it can shrink, um, there's normally a funding formula that the legislature uses, and there's been a number of discussions going back at least 25 years about tinkering with the general local aid formula, but because it's a grant, the state legislature could change it, but I will promise you this, if there's going to be any change, it's going to be done at the state legislature, it's going to be done for someone that you vote for by someone who works for you. If there's any change to local aid, that will not be done by a bureaucrat and administrative agency. It's going to be done by an elected official. So you will have some say and some input into that. So I think that I rate that highly unlikely uh, to answer your question. I, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Grant money normally comes from state tax dollars, but there is a very large section of it that the state holds on behalf of the federal government. The federal government gives out, since Richard Nixon was in office, he revolutionized federal grants to try and avoid pork projects. He said, let's, let's put up a list of priorities, like more housing, more roads, and then let's give out large block grants. They're called community development block grants. And instead, we'll just shovel hundreds of millions of dollars to the states, according to this formula, and then they can sign up, create their own projects, or create anything that checks off any one of those boxes. So a large number of the funds that the state housing program gives out are not even state tax dollars. Many of them are federal tax dollars that are part of these large blocks of funds that they can create programs for and then spend along, along, in line with. Well, it's, it's, it's all taxpayers' money eventually. Believe it or not, I was in my personal income tax class more than a decade ago. I won't tell you how, how much more. Uh, there was a, a study that said that uh, because businesses create either develop uh, the generators of economic engines, something like 70% of the actual revenue earned by the uh, federal government is earned through income taxes that are paid by individual real people. Uh, it's an astoundingly high percentage because it's much easier to take it out of individual people than it is to take it out of businesses. So, is it that extortion at that point? Uh, extortion is a very well in in the in the political sense, yes. In the in the legal sense, extortion is when you threaten or intimidate or harass someone to wrongfully part with money or property. Uh, I think that's the that's crime. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the lesser question, uh, one of the questions they ask you in your first day of law school is, can you steal from a thief in criminal law? Then when you take federal courts, they ask you, can the government commit a crime? And generally the answer is no. The government, for taxpayer reasons, for example, is exempt from most building codes. It's okay for us, the government, to say that you, when you build your house or build your business, you have to have a, a safe building and sprinklers and, and all this stuff, but we, the government, in the name of keeping our taxes low and our expenses low, we're exempt from many building codes, just as an example. So so generally, no, the government can't commit crimes, <laughs> at least when they're doing it in an organized fashion. I'm getting the wrap-up signal, but a couple minutes, ma'am. I was so curious as to where this really, really came from. A couple of years back, I read an explosion that uh, the article was about a government um, child labor might now sign a law making it mandatory that the zoning 
the zoning has to be 50, 51%, you know, it didn't have to be two thirds. And he had previously, two times the legislature put this through, he had vetoed. Then all of a sudden, about three years ago, he said, that, yeah, okay, that we signed that into law. Then all of a sudden, these magic words came out, the affordable housing word, the needs of the MBTA. Now, I work for, I, my career is in government, state, federal, and local, and I have worked with the most wonderful people you could ever know, fabulous. I do not believe in conspiracies on that level. But I'm beginning to believe on some kind of conspiracies on this level, that this has been an effort to get, to change zoning for at least five years, if not more. And finally, third time around, Charlie Baker with Kim Driscoll's influence, and I'm a diehard Democrat, um, pushed, the go they got her his vote. And now we got the wonderful word about affordable because ma property in Massachusetts is so valuable. And I don't know why this isn't across the state. I don't know how the MBTA even got involved and why we would have this housing situation. We got massive acres west of West Worcester, even the east of Worcester, but in Gloucester we do not, in Newburyport we do not, in Ipswich we do not, in Rockport we do not. Where did this ever come from and why? Um. To keep a, a short, simple, pointed answer. Uh, Can you repeat it? Oh, the, the, the question is, what is the source or the genesis of the 40B uh, or 40A um, affordable housing or MBTA zoning mandate? Uh, the answer is it appears to have been a confluence of several dif different interests. I'll tell you that the housing policy community has had a wish list for decades. Uh, there is the, at Northeastern University, uh, Mike and Kitty Dukakis have a Center for Urban Studies, and every year in, a, in line with the Greater Boston Housing Foundation, they put out numbers about, you know, what would be good housing policy, and, and, and since every year since 2017, they have said that Massachusetts is in a housing crisis because we do not have enough housing to support the demand. So if this is a long... Certainly. Uh, so so uh, since 2017, the Greater Boston Housing Fund and the Dukakis Center have told us that we're in a housing crisis uh, because there isn't enough to go around. Whether it's affordable or not, there just isn't enough housing to go around. Um, in, 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 then, then we also had, had some, some uh, Developers are starting to have petered out Chapter 40B. Uh, when, I was on, when I first got onto the Winfield Housing Authority almost 10 years ago, uh, the number of communities that had complied with Chapter 40B's 10% threshold uh, was only about 13, including Linfield. We were number 11. We were very proud of that with the Market Street development. The number now, as of June of this year, is approximately 73 out of 351. And, and a lot of the remaining communities are places that are well and truly rural, like uh, Lunenburg or Holly, that are way out west and that don't have a lot of infrastructure. In terms of the sources, the MBTA sort of got into it by accident. The idea of a transit-oriented housing, this kind of a walkable neighborhood that you could use mass transit to substitute for a car, that's been kicking around in several policy papers, and MAPC has been pushing it since 2014. I believe the idea traces back at least 15 decades. But all of a sudden, as I understand it, there was a great big housing bill, and Governor Baker may or may not have been on his way out the door, and he said, is there any, to the housing folks, is there any policy that you've ever wanted? And then if you're a developer, the one thing you really want, if you're a professional developer, the one thing you really want is more housing, and you want to make it really easy. The, 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 th the reason 40A under this MBTA housing creates such a, a, a spur is because it's of right. Once you draw this district, the apartments can go up as of right. There is no ZBA permission. There's no planning board sign off. As long as they comply with the environmental and the sanitary code, they can essentially build it. I mean, the towns retain a little bit of control over and I mean a very little control over like things like height, but there isn't a lot of restrictions. You can go and put hundreds of people in on small locations. Um, hopefully that answers the, the larger part of your question. And, and, and I'm getting the time signed, so I will hand this over. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. And next, please give a warm welcome to Tracy O'Neill. Okay. 
uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tracy O'Neill. I am a Gloucester resident. I was a ward city councilor, but um, got redistricted out of my ward. That's okay. Um, I live within a half mile of the train station, so this is very concerning to me, right? People only get involved when, what's it gonna do to me, right? All right, so can you go to the, yep, MBTA communities. So MBTA communities, I have a different slide than you, but that's okay. Um, what is an MBTA community, right? Currently, communities have filed for interim compliance. Full compliance for MBTA communities is December 2024. Compliance to what? What are we complying to? Compliance to the MBTA communities designation program is a state overlay zoning district. So compliance with the state means you accept that the city is a state overlay zoning district. The designation encompasses the entire Gloucester community. Is this on? Yes. Okay. The entire Gloucester community and all 177 identified communities, municipalities. The state has no control over local zoning. I'm going to repeat that. The state cannot change our zoning laws. In our city, only the city council can do that. So on that table, as you came in, there's yellow sheets of paper with every single city councilor on it. Their email address, their phone number, the ward they're in. If you don't know what ward you're in, sign, write your name on a sign-up sheet and send me an email. I'll tell you what ward you're in. Um, so only city council can change zoning laws in Gloucester. Only town meeting can change zoning in your, if you're a town. That's really important to know. Um, compliance is achieved through participatory municipal, municipal vote, votes. Okay? The state is trying to control municipal zoning across the eastern half of the state. A yes vote will result in a loss of local control and seeding of local zoning sovereignty. We will no longer be able to build what we want to build, where we want to build it, how high we want to build it, how close we want to build it. The state will decide that for us. Uh, as an example of a state zoning overlay district, the first image is Gloucester Harbor zoning districts. There we go. So the dark purple, is the state designated port area, the DPA. This is a state overlay zoning designation for marine industrial ports around the state. There are restrictions within this area which prohibit non-marine industrial uses such as housing and yacht marinas. Every 10 years, the harbor plan must be reviewed and approved for compliance by the state. So did you get that? All right? Every 10 years, Gloucester must review its harbor plan and ask the state if that's okay. Okay, that's an overlay. That's what an overlay program is. You have to ask the state, we would like to do this, is that okay? Um, in 2014, when the DPA boundary was reviewed and East Gloucester was removed, that action was subject to state approval. We had to ask the state, is that okay with you guys? Any changes must be state approved. There is very little local control in an overlay district. Can we go back to the first slide with all the communities? That, those are overlay districts, okay? Every single district, city, and town on that slide or that map is an overlay district, which will be controlled by this. I'll ask questions, I'll answer questions later which will be controlled by the state. If you vote yes, if your city council votes yes, if your town meeting votes yes, the state will control every single one of those communities. All right. Um, the second slide is the state MBTA t transit oriented district overlay zoning district. That's it right there. Once a municipality votes yes and is state approved, 
if a municipality votes yes, and if it is state approved, there will be no withdrawing from the TOD without approval of release by the state. Now, why would the state release you from something it's making you do? All right. The state will have jurisdiction over this district and the entire MBTA community district. Slide three. Where are we? All right. So this is just a slide that I put in there. I went searching on my, one of my favorite websites, the um, mass.gov. And I came across this, and this slide I took off the website, I believe. And it says, the MBTA has real estate assets available for leasing throughout the Commonwealth. Can we have the next slide? Yep, and in case you didn't believe me, there's a website, mbtarealty.com, transit-oriented development, just waiting for you to send them an email. Yeah, we have property you can lease from us so that we can make money. All right, so what else? Do we have another slide? Okay, so the MBTA Communities Overlay Program. Per that program, Gloucester needs to provide for zoning capacity of a minimum. There is no maximum, just so you know a minimum of 2,270 multifamily units. That's not single family, that's not duplexes or two family, that's three family or more. Okay, two family houses don't count as multifamily. 50% of the requirement is in the TOD commuter rail station district. Right, so 50% capacity is 1,135 units that will be absorbed by wards two and three if the city council votes yes on this. The other 1,135 units can be planned for wards one, four, and five. So who lives in East Gloucester, ward one? Okay, what kind of land do you have? State knows. The state knows. The mayor sent that information into the state. That's why we are in interim compliance. He sent in how much land we have, what kind of land it is, where it is, and what it's worth. The state has all that information in a nice little package. So, what is it, the pines over there in East Gloucester? Right? You'll have to, uh, can we have the next slide? Each zone, each, each ward for equitable distribution, each ward will absorb 379 multifamily units, okay? So 379 in Ward 1, East Gloucester, 379 in Ward 4, Anasquam, Riverdale, okay? There's land out there. There's woods out there, and the state knows it. Ward 5, West Gloucester, you got woods out there, okay? Plenty of woods. So each person here, and I know there's people here who are not from Gloucester, which I so very much appreciate you coming, because as Attorney Walsh said, the more communities we get, the stronger we will be, okay? Um, so, yeah. 379 in each ward. So the halyard is 400 units. I mean 200, sorry. So think of two more halyards in, in ward one, or 30 10, 10 unit houses, or 10 30 unit houses. Really, 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 really think about where you're gonna put that in ward one, in East Gloucester, in Riverdale, in Anasquam in West Gloucester. All right, so the next slide, please. So what we really, really need to understand is that this 3A is an MBTA Communities Overlay Program, okay? That's why there's an umbrella. 
It's an umbrella program. If you have umbrella insurance, you know what that's all about, right? So the first mandate, mandate number one, transit-oriented development. That's mandate number one. If you comply with this, it just opens the floodgates for mandate number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So because if you comply with this first mandate, the state takes over. The state controls what happens in these overlay districts. That's period the end. So housing production mandate is, is reasonable to expect to happen, right? Um, there's already housing production uh, in, the, uh, in the works. I can't remember where I've read it, but um, I believe RKG, is it RKG, the, um, the consultants for Gloucester mentioned production. I went to that meeting. They mentioned production. Um, so mandate number three, right? Now these have question marks. These are not, you know, this is not etched in stone. This is like, what can I brainstorm to figure out if they control my city and my neighborhood it's just so far beyond my comprehension that, that they can sit in the state house and tell me what's good for me and my neighborhood. Anyway, after this TOD, once they control this overlay, right, we're under this umbrella, it's reasonable to expect mandate number two, housing production. It's reasonable to expect regional bus lines because you gotta get the bus out to Anasquam. You gotta get it out there, right? The train don't go there doesn't go there, excuse me. All right, mandate number four, now you need to drive economy, right? So what do you want, a casino? Because you need, now you need economy. All right, and number five is we need more economy. So how about a factory? Well, we can make some shoes, or we can make pocketbooks, or we can, it doesn't matter what the mandate is. It matters that they can do this. They will do this if your city council votes yes. Now, Attorney Walsh talked about Milton, they voted no, and now they're getting sued. So why even bother having a vote? Is this Russia? <laughs> I'm serious, it's, this is not funny. This is very scary to me. This is scary. Why have a vote if you can't vote no? So that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I hope I can answer them. <laughs> Tracy, I'm, I'm a little confused only because um, in West Boston here in Boston, that, yep. you had a little under 400 multi unit uh, uh, dwellings for Ward 5. Yep. I was under the impression that because we also have train stations, we fall under the same mandate as downtown Boston and could actually have that expanded substantially more. But, well, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, it's up to the state, right? Once, if you've got a train station within a, a half mile radius, they right. are the same. Right. So we're only on the hook for one yeah, TOD? Yes. Well, I will do my best to um, share my TOD with you. But I, I have, I have, uh, right. I have, I honestly and truly have great faith in the citizens of Gloucester to reach out to their city councilors day in and day out, call them, email them, text them, because they have the power. And we give them the power. So they need to know that the majority of the citizens of this city do not want to be controlled by the state. The West Gloucester station can be impacted, yes. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of wetlands out in West Gloucester, and there's a lot of septic systems out there. So it, there's, you know, um, not everyone in West Gloucester is hooked up to um, 
city sewer. So you start, you know, you, you're gonna. I, just as a matter of point, yeah. A lot of the city is supplied with water, for, for drinking water from West Washer. So it is a city issue. It's not just a, a Ward Five or a Ward One issue. Right. It's everybody that drinks water. From the city. But I want to know whether they only have that acreage obligation around the Hickory and Gloucester, or is there a separate obligation to the West Washer city? Well, uh, can you answer that? that? Do you know the answer to that? Okay. All right. So I just I just conferred with Attorney Walsh, and he says West Gloucester Station West Gloucester Station is eligible, but it's up to the city where they put it. Okay. It, it, the, if the city city council wants to put half at the, the uh, downtown. And half at West Gloucester. But it's not required to do another half mile at West Gloucester. It's up to the city. The law says we just have to do it. And however we divide it up. Hold on, I can't hear you. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen, Tracy O'Neill. Thank you, Tracy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Christine Galicia. Okay, I think I'm on now. I'm on. All right, thank you very much for having me. A few of you may recognize me. I helped out with your mayoral debate and some councilor debate. So my name is Christine Delisio. I do, I am a resident of Manchester and I serve on the planning board. I am here as a resident and concerned citizen um, that is, you know, obviously biased and opposed to this unfunded mandate. So one thing that I do want to back up and say a few things. When this bill was passed, this was one paragraph. And that is what our representatives voted on. They, rep they voted on one paragraph, maybe 20 lines. What is concerning now is the guidelines, right? They didn't vote on the guidelines. There's two documents that are a question, the statute and the guidelines. Our representatives voted on three paragraphs, overwhelmingly agreed to it, but now what's in question is how these guidelines have come out and how they're impacting each community in different ways. And every community is different and the concerns of each community are quite different. All right, so can you go to the next slide, Kelly? Okay, so here is the actual 40A, section 3A. 
It's not very long. Um, I will read it and then talk about the guidelines next. An MBATA community shall have a zoning ordinance or bylaw, and that's the difference between a city and a town, that provides for at least one district of reasonable size in which a multifamily housing is permitted as of right. That means there's no special permit. That means you could have some design guidelines in place, but basically, if you meet whatever your zoning law is that your community approves, as long as they meet what you are going to vote in, then you can build it. Provided that each such multifamily housing shall be without age restriction and shall be suitable for families with children for the purposes of this section, a district of reasonable size, and this is important, a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre subject to any further limitations imposed by Section 40A, Chapter 131, and Title V. Title V is our septic systems of the State Environmental Code established pursuant to Section 13 of Section 221A. Okay, then this district must be located within a half a mile of the commuter rail, subway station, or ferry. And this is um, a little bit different for town. So for Gloucester, 50% of your community, your overlay district, must be within a half a mile. Manchester, Rockport um, is a little bit smaller, so only 40% of our community needs to be in it, but Gloucester is 50%. An MBTA community that fails to comply with this section, so basically that's it, right? So there's what you have to do, and if you don't do it, you will not be eligible for funds from the Housing Choice Initiative, the local capital projects, Mass Works, and because those sticks weren't enough, they recently added Section 4, which is the Housing Works Infrastructure Program established in 20, Section 27. So then Section 3, the three parts of this, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, in consultation with the Executive Office of Economic Development, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, and the Massachusetts DEP shall promulgate guidelines to determine if an MBTA community is in compliance. All right, that's what we voted on for much. So, next, what happens? The next is the guidelines, and that's what we as MBTA communities are subject to. So it should say compliance guidelines? Yeah, there we go, okay. So the compliance guidelines are about 45 pages. They're on the Massachusetts MBTA state website. The state website is full of lots of information. If you have any questions, it is very well laid out. But this is the outline of the guidelines. So the guidelines are there to help communities come into compliance with the statute. There is a modeling tool which the state has um, given some consultants access, full access to that can put onto your community overlay districts and using a GIS system to figure out where best these communities may lie. So each district has to be five acres and you must zone for 15 units per acre. And if anyone needs to know what that looks like, it's typically a three family. A three family, three stories, that's about 1,000 square foot a floor. So that is what maybe a unit of 15 acres would look like. So then you have to imagine that on top of an acre. So um, there's quite a few units that could be put on that acreage. The next one is talking about as of right. As of right means if you meet the height, setbacks, you get the building permit. So do abutters have a say? Nope. Do you have to go to have any kind of approvals? No. You can go to whoever your municipality designates as the community or the board that's going to look at some guidelines, some design guidelines, and they will say yes or no. They actually cannot say no. Um, that is part of these compliance guidelines. Whatever your design guidelines are cannot make whatever you want to build economically unfeasible. So each community has a minimum gross density. Tracy put that slide up earlier. And then the next section is determining suitability for families with children. So this is unlike a 40B where you can go in and say, I would like to have 
um, stitch, say, in a 100-unit development. I want 10 studios, 10 two-bedrooms, 10 one-bedrooms, and the rest three bedrooms. You um, need to make units that are appropriate for families with children. So studios, do we think that a studio is appropriate for families with children? Probably not. Do we think a one bedroom is appropriate for children? Probably not. So we're talking at least a minimum of two bedrooms. So there we go with maybe affecting our schools and there is not a maximum on size of bedrooms. So are you going to make more money on a square footage of a small footprint with two bedrooms or four bedrooms? What's the developer gonna choose? I would say four. Location of districts. We've talked about the districts. At least in Gloucester, 50% must be within a half a mile. Besides that, it can be anywhere else as long as it is a unexcluded land, or an excluded land is land that belongs to the municipality, which includes schools, it includes um, wetlands, and includes waters, pieces of bodies of water. So those lands are excluded, so you cannot include those in your land masses. Churches can be included. Hmm. So there we talked about location of districts. Determining compliance. So we have the first 12, the high um, rapid speed transit communities and Milton it has been in the news. If you've been watching that, they decided that they were going to take a vote and they voted against complying with this law. So the other remaining communities are in compliance. So this law takes into consideration not a lot of uniqueness of our neighborhoods and our towns and cities. So as Michael had said earlier, some communities may say this is fine, we're just gonna keep up with the grant money because we already do this. And some other communities are drastically and gravely concerned about what this would do to your um, character, density, all the things because we're unique. It's gonna be different for each community. So um, what, that does, what that um, determination of compliance is gonna be an individual community. So some towns will, or some municipalities will vote um, as a town, others your council will vote, and you need to submit something to the state 90 days ahead of this vote. The state will come back to you and say whether this district is in compliance or not, and then your community can vote on it. So we are looking at the end of this year for compliance for Gloucester, Rockport, um, Ipswich. Essex is a small adjacent community. They have another year. So a majority of these communities are, have a deadline of the end of this year. All right, I think I'm going to, next slide. All right, so affordability. 40B put on communities this number that they believed that we needed to comply with in order to um, have a decent amount of affordability in our communities. That number is 10%. So if you don't comply with that 10%, um, a developer, a 40B, is available to your community and they'll come in, it would be friendly or unfriendly, and they will develop without, with very minimal respect to your zoning, and then you will be um, a little bit closer to your number. So for instance, Manchester, we need about another 110 units to be in compliance with the 40B law. So any units built under this 40A at this point, there is no affordability requirement. So any unit that is built will only add to this number that our communities need to build. So, you can, as Michael, I think, believed, said earlier, allocate for 10%. So at a minimum, you will break even. You will, anything that is built will just, as I said, break even. If you build 10 and you 
afford one unit affordable, you will not have any increase in your 40B needs. But if you don't designate affordability in this 40A, then you are going to go in arrears even more. So in order to get ahead and apply for 20% affordability under this, you need to have a economic feasibility study. You need to um, put, give that to the state at least 90 days, and then they're going to come back and look at it and tell you whether they think that your community is eligible for that. So a few communities have done that. Um, I believe Danvers was accepted for the 20%, and there's many more applications in the works. We're still waiting to see what um, the housing EOC HD says about that. All right. Next slide, please. All right. A recent change to the guidelines included mixed-use development. Mixed-use development means that there's some kind of commercial base, usually a first floor shore storefront with maybe a second or third floor housing. What is happening in some communities, especially smaller, is that the downtown area closest to the trains, where this would make more sense, is that if you use this half a mile, our storefronts would be able to be turned into housing and the community would be left with no commercial base. You would drive this out. So just for an example in Manchester, we have a small grocery store. This mandate is designed to have people walk. So the small grocery store, if this was in this housing district, you could not leave it there. It would be subject to be demolition and some kind of housing development put there. So they changed the guidelines and said, okay, we see that this is an issue and we are going to allow you to keep this first floor commercial, but what's gonna happen is you can't use the land for your acreage in your overlay district. You can count the housing that's there, but you can't count the acreage. Does that make sense? Okay. Say it one more time. So if you have a commercial downtown or you know a small vibrant downtown in order to keep that because this is as of right as of right means you can build what you're zoning so whatever each community gets to make their own zoning but whatever you say it is you cannot keep this commercial base there because of the as of right as of right means no one has a say. So you can't keep the first floor commercial. Someone can tear the building down or kick out the commercial base and allow housing in that space. That's, that's what they're saying. So in order to preserve these needed commercial bases, they changed the guidelines and said, you can have this mixed use development, but it can't be more than 33% of the floor area. There's a lot, and you can go read the details. But basically, in essence, you can keep the first floor, but this is no longer an MBTA district. You can count the housing, but you can't count the land. So they are recognizing that we do need commercial places, restaurants, um, grocery stores, corner markets, in order to service the people, because this MBTA zoning, everyone is supposed to be walking and riding bicycles. No one is expected to have cars to get around. All right, did that clear? All right, next slide, Kelly. All right, so the timeline for compliance, I touched on this. The 12 communities, are, their deadline was at the end of 2023. Everyone except for Milton did comply. The remaining communities are the end of this year and adjacent small towns have until the end of 2025. All right, next slide. So the effects of non-compliance. And I feel like this is where this is where um, non-compliance, it's not necessarily in my gut to say no, but why are, why are more people not questioning this? I mean, we heard that zoning is a local um, effect of our state. There is two kinds of zoning or two kinds of municipal or states. We have Dillon's rule and home rule. And Massachusetts has been an 
modeling this kind of density after California. California is a Dillon rule state. They don't have the same home rule protections that Massachusetts does. And people need to read, become educated, and not fear the thought of saying no. The effects of noncompliance are withholding of grant money. And if you've looked at any of the grants that the municipalities have received, you're not guaranteed grant money. You apply for grant money, and the state determines whether you are you know, in, you're the, the most in need for this grant money. So saying that you're going to take away the grant money is a little bit of an exaggeration. You're going to take the right to apply for it away, and that right was never guaranteed to begin with. So I think it's important for each community to figure out exactly what your municipality has accepted for grant money. This information, is difficult sometimes to get from a municipality. And we have this mechanism, it's called the Freedom of Information Act. And let's see, it's one of maybe the next slide. And actually, it's in here. Um, so in Gloucester, you actually have on your town, your city website, a page specifically for freedom of information request. You um, are entitled to any information that the government has under their fingertips. So I, as a citizen, would recommend that each person, depending on where you're from, ask your community what this grant money has, what grant money your community has been allocated, and exactly find out what that money is. The state started with three buckets of money, and they've added a fourth, and they keep adding 13 buckets of money because the stick hasn't been strong enough. So the first three buckets that they started with, people were like, eh, it's pennies, no big deal. We'll just say no. But now they keep adding buckets and buckets of money. So. Do we really feel like that is a great way to run this lovely state of Commonwealth of Massachusetts by forcing the citizens to do something and threatening our own tax dollars? I would say not. All right, so back to that slide. There's four buckets of money. The Housing Choice Initiative yep, is one. And we can go into these details, but I don't really think it's super. I just want to make it. The state or the city or town uh, are concerned about the funds being required to help. You need a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. The it won't, is, be, on the, it won't be on the screen. It won't be recorded. You need to speak into the mic. It won't be recorded. The big. The state, the town. The state is threatening us and the towns are concerned about the loss of funding, but nowhere is the, the state indicating or the local towns indicating how much more it's going to cost us to house all these people, to school all these people, to provide water, sewer, police protection, uh, parking, and not, not to mention the quality of life. No one's mentioning that. That's going to add up to significant money, probably even more than any of these grants will amount to. But it will depend on the town, of course. But I just want to make that point. Identify. Identify. No. <laughs> I would like to say, um, the, as far as Gloucester is concerned, uh, 3A, grant money, we would not receive money from the local capital projects fund. We received zero in the last five years. The Housing Choice Initiative, we received zero in the last five years. The mass works infrastructure, I, look, I had the um, city auditor send me this information when I was a counselor. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, and the MassWorks infrastructure program, we got $3 million for because they ripped up a neighborhood to lay the pipes and the infrastructure for the Halyard apartments. If they didn't build the Halyard, we wouldn't have needed the three million. So I don't know about the fourth one. I don't know, I haven't researched that one. So just so you know, we could zero, zero, and we didn't really need if we didn't build that complex. All right, sorry. Can you go to slide 27, please? So there are four buckets of money. And I, like I just mentioned, I recommend um, requesting this information so you have accurate data. I don't think I need to go into it. It's getting a little bit late. All right, so can you please go to slide 29? Two more slides. Uh, go back one, maybe, if you can. Yep, all right. So some of the misconceptions that people are talking about. And one is, okay, 2,700 plus units. It's just about zoning. We don't actually have to build it, right? So don't say we have to build it. That's a misconception. We only have to zone for it. Well, if you go and look at California's history, that's where California started over 20 years ago. And now California is mandating it because the production wasn't there. So this is the first step, in my opinion, in massive state overreach. So does existing multifamily housing count towards the capacity number? It depends. So I'm not familiar with Gloucester zoning. If someone wants to inform me in a second, that's fine. But the basic tentament here is that the underlining zoning allows for family by right. If it was built by right, it will count. If you have a two family and this is in a new zone and you add an apartment to it and now it's three family, it will not count. So here's the example. If a triple desk, if a triple decker exists, doesn't that mean that it's allowed? In this case, no. If the parcel that the triple decker sits on is zoned for single family only, then the building is considered pre existing, non conforming, and the zoning capacity for multifamily housing on that parcel will not be counted as, or will be counted as zero, even though the building contains three dwelling units. Is right there. Okay? So what we can do in our small New England towns, most of our properties are pre-existing non-conforming. So in order to get these districts in conformance, we can change the underlining zoning. So that would mean taking, say, a 5,000 square foot lot and shrinking it to what the minimum denominator could be. What, 2,000 square feet, 3,000 square feet? Then these may count. I mean, we have to play this out and see what the state says. But this, when people say, oh, Gloucester's almost there. Manchester's almost there. Heard last week, Rockport's almost there. Okay, look at the underlining zoning. Does it allow for multifamily housing units? If the answer is no, no, you're not almost there. You actually have to change. And once that change happens, we have no idea, or maybe we can predict what the building will look like. So that's, that's a very big consideration. Is that clear? All right. Is anyone fighting this? <laughs> All right, is anyone fighting this? Milton actually voted no last week. It's in the news all over. Holden, Littleton, others. So one thing I wanted to step back, and Winthrop has been very vocal on social media, and talking to some of the residents there. We talked about whether this, you know, our representatives knew what they were voting on in 2021. They voted on that small paragraph. What the question is now is you should ask your representatives, do they agree with the guidelines? And in talking to residents from Winthrop, you know, it's different for each community. Winthrop is almost like an island. There's one way in, flooding, you know, it's no. Their representatives are saying, no, this isn't appropriate for Winthrop, but they also have Revere. And you know what? Revere may be appropriate, but the bottom line is it shouldn't be the state telling us what to do. It should be 
our own communities figuring out what we should be doing. We have spent time and money and consultants on planning boards, on task force and subcommittees, making housing production plans, coming up with master plans, and this is overreaching all this work that all these communities have done to try and figure out what's best for our community. So each community is gonna be a little bit different and why this may not be right for them, but the bottom line is this isn't the state's place to come in and tell us where we need to put housing. All right, if I am in an MBA, MBTA overlay district, can I? Can you build a single family house? Sure. So I did hear something earlier that I may want to correct, and I do want to pride ourselves on saying factual information. So if anyone does hear anything that they don't believe is true, I would like to be corrected. So you doesn't mean you can't build a single family home in one of these districts. But what it does do is that it would prevent potentially, or would prevent, say, if you had a large lot and you wanted to donate some of that land to be um, preserved. Could you do that? The answer is probably not, right? Because that's gonna throw the balance off. There's these things called excluded lands, which I touched on earlier, municipal lands, um, bodies of water, pre preser preserved lands, those are excluded, they're not in a zone. So if you want to donate some of your land to conservation, it would throw off the acreage of your district. So now you're gonna have to go get state approval, and I think that's what basically Tracy was trying to say earlier. This isn't your land anymore. You have to actually get state approval, and the municipality would have to go and find some other land now to offset whatever you wanted to do with your property. So this is a basic property infringement. Hopefully everyone is seeing that. Could you build senior housing on it? Yes. Could you build affordable housing on it? Yes. But could you do something that's going to th off, throw off the balance of the acreage? No. The state is going to have to jump in and approve it, and you're going to have to change probably the district. All right. I think there's maybe one more. All right. So what happens if all these communities get together and 3A is overturned and your community <laughs> and your community decided to be someone that was in compliance we said whatever we want the grant money we want to you know be a good citizen and toe the line well you're kind of stuck with this at this point right this mandate, this statute says that it has to come back to the local communities. This is your will, this is your doing this of your free will. So it's not going to be overturned if 3A is overturned. If your community votes this in, it's yours. It's yours to keep until you as a community decide to overturn it. And I think that's really important that people understand that. The state is telling us this. We have to vote this in ourselves, right? So they're not making us do it. Well, how We'll see what Milton happens with the receivership and whatnot. But that's an important thing to note, that if you accept this zone and 3A is overturned and deemed unconstitutional, you voted it in, so it's yours to keep. All right. Yes, sir. I've got a, a question, I think, for Tracy. Do we know, uh, it's actually uh, two questions, do we know the position of the Boston City Council? Are they preparing for public debate and discussion on this issue? Or do they have anything planned to bring this to the, the forefront of the residents? And number two, do we have any idea of the stance of our state representatives? I'll take the second question first. Um, might have been two years ago, I saw Ann Margaret on the board for the, um, the Canon dedication. And I asked her if she voted for, you know, 40A, 3A, and she said she'd have to get back to me. So then I went, I asked Bruce Tarr, and he said, well, you have to understand it was part of a bigger package, and it was unanimously voted for in the Senate. So as far as our state reps, those are the answers for that. Um, I don't want to call them out, but we do have a city council here. I'm hoping that they listen to the people. Uh, 
I, so my understanding is that the planning board, this is what happened two years ago. The planning board came up with zoning amendments. Then they sent it to the subcommittee of the city council called planning and development. So then planning and development approved it and sent it to the city council. So planning, the planning board has meetings that you can listen to, but you can't interact, you can't ask questions. Planning and development, which is a subcommittee of the city council, so there's three city councilors on that, they have meetings. When they have meetings, you can listen, and when they have public hearings, you can speak. They can, the, when they have meetings, it's up to the chair of the planning, of planning and Development Committee if they want to allow you to ask questions. And sometimes there's just too many people on the call and whatever, for whatever reason. Um, and then it goes to City Council from Planning and Development, it goes to City Council. And then City Council has a public hearing. So you have to be vigilant and go on the city website um, I can send you, if you're on my email list, I can send you the steps to follow because there's some steps. You have to go to gloucester-ma.gov, then you have to go to public hearings, and then you have to go to either agendas or um, public hearings will give you the Zoom link, and it'll give you the date and time. Agendas will give you the agendas. So there's, there's a little bit of navigation there but you have to be vigilant in going on that city website, paying attention to when they're having planning board meetings, listening to them, you don't have to listen to them live because they record them, so you can listen to them afterwards and say, oh, well, I heard they said this and they said that, and you know, they, don't, they seem like they're in favor of it or, or they, they seem like they're listening to us, but you can't speak at a planning board. You can speak, it's up to the chair if you speak at the planning and development, but you need to, 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 if you can't watch them live, those two committees are recorded. Um, and you should listen to them to. Uh, no, so. Um, Rick. Oh, my name is Rick Newton. I'm chair. Okay. So, we have public hearings and we have public meetings. Right. So it's correct that in a public meeting, you can listen, you can participate by listening, uh, but there is no requirement under the council for meeting laws during a public meeting that there's, you know, it's a word, essentially. Public hearings at the planning board are very different. No different from a public, you know, a city council meeting, right, where there is an obligation to have the public speak. So I only want to make that distinction. Uh, we've had a kickoff meeting with our consultant, uh, three-day consultant. It's exhaustive. We are on a tight timeline. Um, everybody is, can avail themselves as crazy. They mentioned um, that it's on, this, on the city's website. There is 24 slides uh, that the consultants take and prepare for us. Um, and we will do our diligence to get to a compliance issue. Um, but again, there's not a one size fit all as it's been touched on briefly here. Um, but it will be a transparent and an open process, not only at the planning board level, but the PD level, the chair, Mr. Grove, um, and certainly at the city council level. So there's plenty of opportunity for the community to participate either in writing or in person, because we're now a hybrid with the planning board, and also through the clerk's office. So ready. So I have a question, Rick. Rick, I have a question. I have a question. You said you're hybrid now with the planning board? Yes, sir. So are you meeting in person now from, from the last meeting you had to going forward? We're not required to, but we've made that decision. Okay, so I didn't know that. And when is the last time the planning board had a public hearing? We have them all the time. Public hearings with the public can speak? Well, I mean, so literally, we have just come out of Zoom, right? And there's no obligation under the open meeting laws in, in a virtual setting. But back in the hybrid 
hybrid setting, we have public hearings. Right, but so when's the last public hearing you had that you let the public speak? So three years ago. Right, so the city, yeah. So the city council. <laughs> city council's been on Zoom and they've had public hearings on Zoom, so. So we have people participate in public hearings. Right, three years ago. Well, because the last meeting you had was with RKG, is it? And we couldn't speak. The public could not, the public couldn't speak. So the last public hearing where you could listen to us was three years ago. I misspoke with the three years, Grace. Oh, well, during, during, during what, three years. right, right. And you just came out of Zoom like, what, two weeks ago last week? Yeah. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure. Do you know when you're going to have your next public hearing by the planning board? But will they be public hearing? Will will they be public hearings or public meetings where we cannot speak? Go ahead. Jason Rose, chair of the Planning and Development Subcommittee of the County Council of the Large. Great. As part of the three-day process that the consultant is engaged for the city, there are three specific dates, three specific public meetings at which the public will be able to in addition, meeting or hearing? These are meetings that the public can participate in. They are public meetings for public participation, as opposed to a public hearing, which is giving sort of testimony to your position. You are invited to participate in those meetings as we have been doing with the CPS. Right. Right. And they're going to give us crayons and markers and Legos to work with, right? I don't know, Tracy, I'm not running meetings, but you are going to be at the meeting public. <laughs> No, it's, they said it. RKG said it two weeks ago. Then we will have public hearings by the planning board and public hearings by the city council as we approach the end of the process. Will P&D have public hearings as well? We will not have a public hearing at P&D. Okay. We will have public hearings at the city council. As chairman of the P&D committee, it's your um, designation, if you will, allow the public to participate. Are you willing to do that? It depends, to be honest with you. The reason, the reason I ask that is there are times when we become so contentious that we, we, we don't actually get anything accomplished. I'm very much in favor, as you well know, because you were on the Indian side. That's right. I was very open mm -hmm. and very, very uh, willing to make sure that people had the opportunity to speak to PD. And we had several meetings that I got to went on for several hours where I allowed people to speak. That's true. And that is true. That I'm not open to nope, that's true. Public commentary in this process. Well, that's, no, I, um, that's true. Because I was on P&D with you and we had meetings that went to midnight and later um, because of that. But I just want to ask if going forward, if you are still willing to do that and let the people speak to you at P&D. Yeah, we'll see, how, we'll see how it goes, to be honest with you. All right. I think they depend largely on where we are in the process and what's going on. But again, I, I have no problem with the public hearing. Okay. Wow. Next question. Yes, sir. I wanted clarification on something Christine said. But Can't hear you. I wanted clarification about the 90 day notice to the state from the planning board. That's 90 days before the time of the vote for the town meeting. So, I'm rallying <clears throat> in May with our public hearing with the planning board. Um, there are all sorts of objections and people that want to raise issues, but what you're saying to me is it's a done deal because if our meetings in May, we're not able to affect any kind of a, a recommendation that the planning board is going to make because it's, in, it's outside that 90 day window. Ask for the document. See what they submitted. So yes, I mean, so that is a question. So there should, in my opinion. cannot be changed now because the public is making an outcry and is saying we want it to be changed. It's too late. If there's a change, for example, if someone stands up in the floor of town meeting and amends their article, uh, then that article is no longer pre-approved by the state and it may not be compliant even if it is in most other regards. Essentially, it's kind of a pre-clearance. It's an idea they borrowed from Chapter 40R. 
Uh, yeah, but yes, essentially, in short answer, as you're right, unless the voters in Rowley at the town meeting vote exactly what was submitted to EOHLC, the state may reserve the right to say that you're not in compliance. The pressure is brought to bear on the planning committee, planning board rather, between now and then, and they make some sort of amendment to whatever they submitted. That will be listened to, or that will be offset in terms of any kind of lawsuit or any kind of objection? It's supposed to be, and the state's supposed to take input. The reason for the 90 days is to give them advanced time to pre-clear stuff, but uh, in terms of whether or not they'd actually deem it acceptable, if they wanted to give a hard line, they could potentially dig their heels in. Mr. Seppala, with trepidation. We're going to have to wrap up soon, so. I want to say something for the benefit of Gloucester people, even though I'm the Rockport, because the Rockport Planning Board did have a public hearing this past Saturday, and 65 to 70 people showed up there. When they showed up and spoke, almost everybody in the audience had the same concerns that these people have. They don't like it. They don't like the idea of the state forcing a certain district to put up with all of the yeah. compact concentration. It may be true that we need to have more affordable housing in Massachusetts, but it's easy to put it off on one district and then everybody else down on Bass Rocks or uh, Anasquan can say, gee, too bad, but uh, thank God we didn't have to get it. The thing I want to say is today's Gloucester Daily Times, I suggest people go to these hearings because it's the only way you're going to know what the hell actually happened. Today's, today's article says, written by Stephen Hagen, uh, Shaw said he believed the board was, for the most part, Shaw is our planning board chairman, successful in communicating the need for voters to vote yes to the plan at annual town meeting. Quote, I think this was a good deal, he said. It's hard to tell what's in people's minds. Sometimes people who agree with what you're saying don't get up and speak, but it seemed like a cause in their meeting. Yeah, 50 people get up and say they don't like it, but it's hard because some didn't get up and speak. It, One it, more question. You've got to listen to it here. In, in. All right, we got it. We got it. We got to move this along. In, in quick deference to Mr. Shaw, he actually submitted an article, a letter to the state that said that this uh, MBTA housing was absolutely horrible for Rockport, and he didn't want it. In deference to Mr. Shaw, he submitted a letter to the state in which he told the state, as they were looking at new guidelines, that, that the guidelines were terrible for Rockport and he didn't want it, and it was a one-size-fits-all, it was awful. He's doing it now, as I understand his public position, because he feels that he's compelled to. Um, and there was another question. Yes. Oh, Is there a distinction between the MBTA community and the DOT? Because I know the DOT has Theoretically, the, question. the question is, what, is the, what other additional dictates may the state impose upon designated MBTA communities? The short answer is that MBTA communities are defined in the MBTA statute, which is chapter 161, section 1, which is the definitions. Uh, there may be more. Test, test. I think it's all fabric. It doesn't, you can't hear anything. Don't worry. Test, test. Is that working? The, the short answer is, is that there may yet be test, more test. mandates that are imposed upon MBTA communities. MBTA communities are defined by Chapter 161, A, 161 Section 1, which is, uh, and the, the state test. can impose any test. additional mandates they want to once they sort of test this concept out and see what happens with it. So, Irene. Who's the consultant? Test. The city of RKG, I believe it's. Rockport's using a firm called Bowen. Well, I believe it's RKG. And they, they actually helped the state write this. <laughs> okay, so this is a la okay. Hold on, this is the last. Yeah. This is it because we got it. We have people got to close up. There's a lot of 
lot of people I talk to, and I, there's one thing that has bothered people, and I don't understand it right now because I think we're talking leaders um, versus, I don't know, ounces or something. The whole thing started for me a couple of years ago with Tracy in the meetings. This miles thing, a half a mile around, the, okay. And then throughout this meeting, there's talk of acreage. Yeah. I, and now I've said to people this, a half a mile around the, the depot doesn't simply mean a half a mile around the depot. It could be 10 acres in Anaswam if they don't have enough space. Now that makes people go, what? 379. I just want to know, what we, when we say half a mile, I was, what are we talking about in area? No, I'm talking about what is the mandate in, it said a half a mile is how many acres? 58. 58. So if we get 40, if we got 20 acres around the depot, we're looking for acres. No, 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 no. This is important because people really get bullshit. No, it's. When I say they can put this, this obligation in anywhere in the city. And so how then they can go do their other acreage within the What is the other acreage? Another 50. So there's a hundred. So we're it's not talking hundred. miles, we're talking acres. Sorry, I said that wrong. It's 25. It's, 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 oh. This is important now because you messed up. I want to tell you why this is important. Because this is where I get people aggravated okay. with this Hold legislation. On. Let's not just say like I messed the numbers up. There's two things you're talking about. Can be anywhere. Can be spread within five acre allotment. In each ward. Anywhere. Anywhere. East Gloucester, West Gloucester, Innisfil, Riverdale. Clayton. Five what? Five It goes like from, does it go like from the um, rotary it to the harbor? The, it was on the screen, hold on. It goes from the rotary to the harbor. This it's is, big. This, this is our anchorage, our half mile around the train station in right, right, right there. there. Right there. Okay, so this is the train station. Hey, this is a half a Yes. Really fast. I'm like, how can any Don't common sense feasibility study be have to mandate a tiny island with one bridge and a half of a tower, you know, a street going up, any kind of evacuate? I mean, how can any common sense feasibility study mandate uh, with, with, with what is the evacuation plan? For this little island, how can this possibly? Remember, this is a top-down policy. The legislature says high density within a half mile. The state housing department tries to fill out the details and then leaves it to the local towns to draw. The answer is, is that I don't know that anyone has thought it's feasible. Nahant has a similar problem. Winthrop has a similar problem. Cohasset and Gosnell have similar problems. Um, I just want to show you
Anybody who wants more information or has a question or is interested in a lawsuit against a joint lawsuit, yep. it's up to you. We're not soliciting it, but we will entertain it. There's a pad over there. Just put your information there. If you want some information, uh, put the contact, uh, your contact information. We'll try to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen.